Um, okay, so you've come in for your orientation and then you've decided you want to become clients. When you come in for your first appointment, we will go over our agreement to mediate. That's essentially our fee agreement. I was going back through, in California you have to keep your files for five years, so I um, store them securely locked in my garage. So I was going through uh, and throwing out and shredding the old files, and the, those uh, initial agreement to mediate were um, two pages long. But the entire 10-page document at this point is behavior modification. It's everything that people have done and gotten tripped up on or tripped us up on um, in terms of client confidentiality and um, our communications vis-a-vis -vis the outside world. Um, there's a kind of interesting confidentiality provision. Do you want me to talk about that? Sure. So mediation is confidential, and it's very highly protected by the law in California. It's protected both by there's a mediation code and there's also a um, settlement code. Um, and so it's protected twice, um, once it, one in evidence and one in family law. And so our communication vis-a-vis -vis the outside world is, is nothing unless we have a written uh, authorization to do so. The work product that's generated during mediation, and we do what we call a resolution roadmap and report, which outlines everything that people talked about during the sessions, and it's you know t usually 15 or so pages long that they, they can take to their accountant um, and that sort of thing. Um, that there's there can be a lot of pressure, uh, particularly when lawyers become involved, they'll start to try to muscle you and tell you that you have to give them copies of stuff and. and it's just so interesting because then when you insist on getting your signed authorization to release this stuff, somehow it magically doesn't appear, even though the lawyer's been telling you that the client wants you to send it. It's just, it's a little nuts. When we get those kinds of situations, I will resend it to the client, and if the client chooses to forward it to the attorney, great. If they don't, then, then that's up to them. But the um, audacity of lawyers to try to tell you what um, they think you ought to be doing is, is really pretty interesting. And that they say that they speak for their clients, yet you'll get the same client in the room and they won't sign the authorization form. So um, those, so the, all of the work product is confidential. Um, we do assume that it gets limited, sort of quasi-confidential circulation that you'll talk about it with your best friend or your lawyer or you know whoever is helping you through your divorce. Um, when we do, a, when, we are, when people are in for a mediation and we have split into two rooms to do a caucus, the, that, those are protected by, protected by confidentiality as per our office policy, and this, this varies from mediator to mediator. The um, caucuses are confidential, so no mediator will tell the other party what the one party said in the caucus unless they have their specific, specific permission to do so. Could you, could you back up a little bit and just tell them what the, what the, kind of the mediation dynamic, the purpose is for the caucus, in other words, physically separating people and going back and forth between the two rooms? What's the That's actually a great issue. Um, I think that having people face to face is what facilitates agreement. But, but I think that a lot of lawyer mediators or retired judge type mediators are uncomfortable with that and they're uncomfortable facing the conflict that results, you know, that you can get pretty hot in the room um, when you're dealing with two people who are getting divorced. And so rather than make it a client centered process to meet their own comfort level, a lot of lawyers will, will have the entire mediation where the two sets of clients are in different rooms. So this is for the benefit of the lawyer rather than the client? Yeah, because we find that cases go about twice as fast and that people report a higher level of satisfaction when they've stayed in the room together, even though we never underestimate how difficult it is for people to do that and talk about everything that anybody cares about in their whole life together, you know, in a three hour session, you're talking about your kids and your house and your hopes and dreams for a marriage that's now failed and then sometimes people have done some kind of evil things to one another and then you're, you've the hurt and the pain and the grief over all of that stuff. I mean, there, it is heavy in that room. It is really heavy. So I can see where lawyers would ask people to be in separate rooms because it's easier on the lawyer, um, but it is not easier on the clients and it is not easier really on the system. Um, when clients are represented by attorneys, they will often demand that, that as much as possible be done in separate caucus because the lawyers are uncomfortable with the conflict too. And I mean, at one point for us, the pendulum kind of swung the other way and we got, I think, a little too a little too comfortable with the conflict and people were starting to really escalate in the joint sessions and because we're used to people yelling all day long every day that it didn't phase us, but clients were uncomfortable. So you've got to always be self-monitoring and self-evaluating what 
how you're doing things. So generally, we will keep people in joint session for as long as that is productive. At some point, though, sometimes people start to really snipe or they can't control themselves or somebody storms out, and you do find yourselves in separate rooms. It, you know, that it, it, even though it slows down the process, and I think it sometimes can be a little counterproductive, it, um, it, it nothing's slower than somebody walking out. So we'll do that. So we the confidentiality is I won't tell anything to the other client that I don't have the specific permission to tell. The issue, though, generally is that it is something that the other person needs to know. So you'll work in caucus about how you might break that news in a way that won't inflame things. Say 100 people like me and my wife, we have a, we're starting with that kind of similar type of back pattern, middle class, not upper class, not lower, lower class. They came in your door, so we know that they're not, the, they're not, the, they're not, the, they're not the, they've self-selected, in other words, they're not the representative of the typical family law uh, client. What, what percentage of people might you be able to bring to a successful, a successful marriage dissolution, for, for lack of a better way of putting it? At this point, almost 100%. Because people want it, and they're ready for it. I mean, everybody who wants it and who's ready for it does it. The people who don't want it or they're not ready, there's a limited amount we can do with that, but the rest of it we can deal with. I mean, whatever the conflict is. The other thing that I think people um, forget, and this is a, a place where uh, advocacy and mediation really don't coincide, is that they're closer <coughs> than they think. You know, out of a list, our typical agenda is um, maybe 30 items long, and we'll use maybe 15 or 20 in any given case. Um, I don't know how many of you saw Wedding Crashers, but like the first four minutes of that is, for me, the first four minutes of the funniest movie ever because they are dealing with, um, they start, we always start our agendas with the easiest things and work our way up. And in Wedding Crashers, they start with the cars and the frequent flyer miles, which is almost always where we start because who cares? You know, I'm gonna continue to drive my car. We'll divide the frequent flyer miles. This is not something that is a hot button issue for most people. So once we've set our agenda, we'll start with the easy stuff and work our way up. You know, usually by the first 90 minutes, we're three quarters of the way through the agenda because most of the stuff is easy. Usually people get a little hot under the collar about spousal support, something to do with the children, um, whether that's a parenting timeshare situation or a move away. Um, and a family owned business can be a very big hot button and um, sometimes retirement plans. You know, it, I think people sometimes, especially the kinds of jobs that have ERISA type retirement plans, people sometimes a little under stimulating and that people will have stayed at a job longer, you know, the post office or something, so that they could plan for a future together, and this was something I'm doing for both of us, and now you've run off with the neighbor, that, that's mine. You know, it, it, there's a sense of betrayal that goes along with that. So the, the feelings people have about money have pretty long legs. But so you've now whittled a 20 agenda, I, or 20 agenda item list down to about four things, which are really the things they're that people think. Right, you've got you've gotten the ball rolling. Whereas if you're an advocate, my job would be to be like, no, the frequent flyer miles are mine, and, and to really polarize and make every single issue into a big deal when really you can wipe two thirds of them off the slate pretty quickly. So, so 